Y'all ready to get into the Word tonight? Amen. All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are the true teacher, Holy Spirit. Come, illuminate our hearts, our eyes, our ears. Teach us tonight by your Spirit, Lord. May we see things we've never seen before and be changed. Lord, take us from glory to glory, from faith to faith. May we be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And if you want to be more like Jesus, say amen. 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 All right, Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. Y'all know that, huh? So we're going to look at something here. I want to just bring out a little something out of this to you tonight. A couple of thoughts. 24, verse 3. This is what's called the Olivet Sermon, where Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. And it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They're wanting to know when things are going to be wrapped up. It's, they're talking about the end of the age. You'll know there's ages in the Bible, and there's going to come an end of this age. We're going to, uh, Jesus is going to return, and he's not coming again to suffer. He's coming to rule and reign. Y'all ready for Jesus to return? Yeah. Yeah. Now, we, we, you know, every generation was believing it was going to be their generation, but we should believe for his return. We should cry out for him to come. It might not be in our lifetime, but it might be in your lifetime. So his disciples are asking, when are these things going to take place? Now really, as I've been studying this, they're kind of asking him this. I want to get this thought in you. When are you going to manifest your kingdom? When are we going to see the manifestation of the kingdom of God? Back then they would say the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of God. They kind of had them in their, their thoughts the same. They, they said, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And they thought that Jesus was going to be a political figure, but he was a spiritual man. His kingdom was not of this world. He was asked that one time. He says, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. He said, but my kingdom is not of this world. So, so let's get this in our mind. Jesus, even though he's in this world, he's in us. Amen? And he's given us dominion in this world. Y'all know that. He put Adam in the garden and gave Adam and Eve dominion over all of the natural world. It says it clear as day in Genesis 2 and 3. We have dominion, but we've got to exercise that dominion. And the only way to do that is to come under his authority. When you're under his authority, then you have authority. When you're not under his authority, you don't have authority. When you're under his power, you'll have power. If you're not under his power, you won't have power. So we've got to be submitting to him if we're going to have any kind of power in our lives. That's why it says he gives grace to the humble. The more we humble ourselves, the more power we're going to have in our lives. How many of y'all like to see more power in your life? Spiritual power. More, more the manifestation of God's kingdom in your life. In fact, whenever the disciples said, teach us how to pray, what did Jesus say? Pray this way. Say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth, what? As it is in heaven. Now we know that Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's dispensing to us his covenant promises, but they're going to come through us. To us, through us. Now get that in your mind. We're supposed to be dispensers of the promises of God everywhere we go. That's why he gives us gifts. That's why he gives us talents. Amen. That's why he's given us his word, so that we can be doers of the word. So God is partnering with us to fulfill his promises. Now let's read what's going on here. So they're wanting to know, when is this going to take place? Okay. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. How many of you know we're hearing about that every day? You can't turn on the news without hearing about wars. More wars, rumors of wars. It says, see that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And he says, a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Let me tell you, the kingdom of darkness is trying to rise up against the kingdom of God right now. Amen. There's more division now than there's ever been in, in our nation, it seems like. Amen? Yeah. It seems like we started getting to a place of healing. And that's why I love our church because our church is multicultural, cultural, multiracial. We, we come from different backgrounds, different color skin, different you know, rich, poor. I mean, it, we, 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 
get rid of the prejudice. We stop looking at the outward part of man. We start realizing that we are of God, the kingdom of God, sons and daughters of God. And the outward part of us is all different. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be political, but I want you to know that there is a devil, and that devil wants to pull us back in our race relationships in, in, in our communities another hundred years. And you know what? As the church, we need to move forward. We need to be the light that shines. Amen. And the only way they're going to know that, he says, there's no greater love than this, that, that a man would lay down his life for his brother. And then he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this the world will know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. So we've got to show this love for one another. Amen? Yeah. We've been teaching about crazy love. Amen? Amen. We've got to show it now, not just talk about it. Amen. Be with somebody. Love on them. Share, your, share God, you know, the love of God and fellowship with one another. Let's keep going. And he says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine. How many know there's a lot of famines right now? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? You know, uh, pestilence. I mean, we've got uh, viruses, sickness, disease, all these things. You hear about them every day. Earthquakes in various places. There's more earthquakes taking place right now on the planet than there's ever been, ever. Then it says... All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. How many know Christians are being killed right now for their faith? And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. They hate to hear about the Christians in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Then he says this, and many will be offended. Now here's one of the key things the enemy uses to divide us. We got, if, if I could say something to offend you. Or somebody do something to offend you. Because offense comes and we separate when we get offended. It's one of the number one tools of the enemy to divide. In a family, you can be offended at a sibling, offended at your, your parents, offended at your, your, your children, offended at your spouse. And you become offended and it brings a wedge in there and the enemy's just laughing the whole time. You know what the answer to offense is? Forgive. I heard a young lady say something about a week ago that just shocked me because there was so much wisdom coming out of a young person, out of, you know, out of the mouths of babes, the Bible says. Amen. Somebody was talking about this thing that bothered them so much and this offense that happened, and, and she just turned to him and says, you know, in another year or month or two or five years, this isn't going to make a bit of difference in your life. Right. Why are you making such a big deal about something that in a few days you won't even remember it? Or another month, you won't even remember it. Because we want to focus on those offenses. That's what the enemy wants you to do. But we need to be what? People that forgive. Yeah. We've got to let it go. How many times are you supposed to forgive? Seven times? Seventy times seven is what Jesus said. And then he told a parable, he said, about a man who owed a lot, and he was forgiven a debt and went out and grabbed him, somebody that just owed him a little bit and wouldn't forgive that debt. And so he came back, the, the word got back to the master. The master got a hold of the first one. He said, you wicked man, I forgave you this great debt, and you went out and you got a servant that just owed you a little bit, and you weren't able to forgive him? In other words, I showed you mercy, but you can't show mercy? I forgave you, and you can't forgive? Amen. I mean, the, the, the motive to forgive is because you've been forgiven. Amen. How many of y'all believe you've been forgiven? Amen. And let me tell you, Power is released when there's forgiveness of sin. I mean, the same power that forgives sin is the same power that raises the dead. Amen. Same power that will heal your body. You know, when they brought the, the, the paralytic, they let him down before Jesus. In, in, in that house, they took the roof off and they let him down. And Jesus went to him and said, your sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees, the religious people said, but this man is blaspheming. How can a, a man forgive sin? And he said, to show you that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, take up your bed and walk? So he looked, and he didn't say the Son of God, he said the Son of Man. Whenever you're seated with Christ in heavenly places, you have that same authority that you can release people by forgiving. And if you don't forgive, there's no power. One of the main places we're going to get power in our lives again is if we walk in this kind of love where we forgive the people that have hurt us. That's right. How many of y'all been hurt by people? Someone sinned against you and it hurt you. You need to forgive them. How many of you did stupid things and hurt yourself? 
How about forgive yourself and know that you're forgiven? You see, when you read the scripture, you'll see when there's forgiveness of sin, there's power to heal. When there's forgiveness of sin, demons come out. Psalms 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Amen. Who forgives all of your iniquities and who heals all your diseases. Forgiveness and healing. Yes. So he looks at that man and he says, Your sins are forgiven you. So the effect of sin, which can bring a curse, sickness, disease, separation, poverty, whatever it is. The effect of that sin now has to come out in the name of Jesus, and this person can get up because they've been forgiven. Jesus Christ paid the price. Amen. Why is it we can believe God to walk down an aisle and pray a prayer, and then you know you're saved and you believe you're going to heaven because you know He's forgiven your sin because you put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but when somebody lays hand to pray for you, you don't believe that you, you're going to be healed. Right. We don't release the same amount of faith. We're not flipping that switch for healing or for prosperity or for whatever it is you have need of that he's promised us. And God doesn't want you to be poor except in spirit. And the reason he said blessed are the poor in spirit because that's the ones who realize they need God. Why do you think you go through trouble before you come to God? Because you get so poor in spirit, you say, like, there's nowhere else I can go to but God. I need God. And that, what, a, what a day in your life when you find out that you need God. Yeah. So your problem's not the problem, it's how you respond to it. Amen. I've been saying that over and over again. And when you respond in faith and not in the flesh, when you get in the spirit, God can lead you through this thing and you'll come out on the other side bigger and better than you were before. You know, in the scripture, there's one place that says when the enemy steals something from you, he's got to repay it five times. Then there's another place, place that says when a thief steals from you, he's got to repay you seven times. Amen. So when the devil steals something from you or steal, kills, and destroys, when we get where we're supposed to be, God will make sure that we get our, our share fair back. Amen? God is a God of increase. Amen. But if we stay in the flesh, if we respond out of anger, un unbelief or, you know, bitterness, unforgiveness. We're trapped. We're trapping ourselves from the blessing of God. So he says right here, many will be offended. And he says, and we'll betray one another. We'll, we'll, we'll I mean, betray, I, I always look at it this way. When, when, a, when you're married to somebody and, and that person commits adultery or or runs off with somebody, they betrayed that love, that, that, that honesty, that, that covenant in there. And you know what? Offense comes, you get offended, the next thing you know, you start looking and you think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. It's not. Amen. You all realize that? Amen. And people start to, to betray one another, and then it says, and we'll hate one another. Some of the, the most hateful things I've ever heard somebody say is something they say about their ex. Now, don't say amen if you, ever, if you got one of those. Amen? <laughs> and it says, many false prophets will arise and deceive many. But because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, I'm going to go there with this. There's a lot of people out there, they're, they're wanting to make a statement. They're wanting to protest. They want us to see that some things need to change. You cannot change for the positive if you're being lawless. Amen. Lawlessness does not produce righteousness. And the only way that something's going to change is if righteousness is involved. Amen. So any preacher that's preaching lawlessness is not preaching the gospel. If they're preaching righteousness, love, forgiveness, they're preaching the gospel. Jesus didn't want to rise up. He said, uh, if my kingdom was of this world, I'd fight like the world. So don't claim to be a minister of the gospel and preach lawlessness. Just say, I'm of the world, and I'm going to do it the world's way. We're going to be lawless to get what we want. Amen? So you know what he's talking about? We have all these people who say they can deceive many people. But you don't be deceived. Amen? Don't be deceived by these things. And so there will be many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And it says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Say, I'm going to endure. This too will pass. 
Amen. You know, and I've seen this in the church, in, in the body of Christ, over all the years I've been in the body of Christ, they'll have a revival over here or somebody will be preaching this one message and it gets, and, and people just go after that one thing for a little while, then they go after something else a little while, and they go after something else, a little, and they kind of swing and they're running after all of these things instead of just walking with Christ and enduring all the way through. He who endures to the end. You need to have a good, solid foundation in the Word of God so that when you hear all of these things, you know that's not of God. I can tell that's not of God. That's called discernment. Now, I, I preached all this to get to this verse. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world as a witness to all nations, and then the, king, then the end will come. Say the gospel of the kingdom. We need to understand what the kingdom of God is. We're not here to, to develop any other kingdom. They wanted to take Jesus and make him king of, of Israel. And he resisted because he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And our kingdom is not of this world because we're sons and daughters of a king. Amen. And his kingdom is spiritual. Amen. And he's in heaven and he's dispensing to us everything we need from that heavenly realm. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, it says you've been raised up together with him, seated in heavenly places. So you speak from that heavenly realm. You, you, you act from that heavenly realm, who you really are. And you call those things that be not as though they were in the earth, and then God moves to bring them to pass. Yeah. That's faith. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. The kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the stuff we're, we're, we're after. And if you read this whole uh, chapter here, chapter 6, it gets to the place where he says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. He said, You cannot serve God and money. He said, Don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about what you eat. That's what the world is always seeking after. In fact, it, what is it, Romans, uh, I got it written down, Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what is the kingdom of God? It's not what you eat, it's not what you drink, it's not what you wear, according to what Jesus said right here. He said, don't worry about anything that's going on in this world, because when you're worrying, he says, it doesn't do you any good. You don't add one cubic to your, your stature, or one hair to your head. Amen. So he's saying the same thing. So the kingdom of God is not really about this natural world. It's about the spiritual world. And do you know that whenever you're going to die, if you're a Christian, you're going to be with him in heavenly places? You're already seated there, so when you die, you just go there. How many are ready to go to heaven? How many want to go tonight? But if Jesus returns, you ought to be ready. Amen. Amen. But you're already in heaven, seated with Christ if we believe the word of God. Amen. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures, right? But, but look at that again. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the way he does things, not the way the world does it. And all of these things that the world is seeking after will be added unto you. It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. How many of you know there's enough trouble today? We don't have to worry about tomorrow. Let's just make it through today. Amen. And you know how we do that? By walking in the kingdom of God. Another way to say it is by walking in the spirit, not the flesh. Right. By being led by the Holy Spirit. For all those that are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Amen. Romans eight fourteen. Amen. Now let's go uh, look with me at uh, Luke chapter 20. I mean chapter 17, verse 20. Luke 17, verse 20. So show me the kingdom of God. That's what they asked him. Can you show us the kingdom of God? Look at verse 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with outward observation. But everybody's looking for the kingdom of God. Show us a miracle, Jesus. Let's see the kingdom of God. So again, let, let's define the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's a kingdom because there's a king. Can we, can we agree on that? This is very practical. What's that king's name? Who's it, what, what, who is the king? Jesus is the king of this kingdom. And no one's going to dethrone him. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. 
He's seated on the throne, and he will sit on that throne forever. Yeah. Amen? So he's the king. Is he your king? Yes. If he's your king, what does that mean? Whatever he says, you obey, right? Yeah. So when a king speaks, is it a suggestion, or are you supposed to obey it? You're supposed to. He's the Lord of lords. He's Lord of your life. That means he doesn't suggest to you what you're supposed to do. He tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. He'll speak to your heart. He'll give you a word out of any situation you're in. He said with every temptation, he'll make a way of escape. So the kingdom of God is not a geographical location. It doesn't come with observation. Listen how he finishes this in verse 21. He says, nor will they say, see here or see there. Indeed, the kingdom of God is what? Within you. Some translation says in your midst. The kingdom of God is within you. You know why? Where is the king right now? Isn't, isn't Jesus Christ in you the hope of glory? It tells us that in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Christ in you the hope of glory. You know what glory is? Glory is the power to change anything in your life. Amen. We want God to be glorified and I want to see his glory. When I'm in the midst of something, I want to see his glory come. But I don't have to do like the world. See, we've been taught, and that's what he was teaching in, in uh, chapter 6 of Matthew, to go here. We go to our boss to get what we need. We go to a doctor to get what we need. We go to the government, and we're looking for every need to be supplied by something outside of us when we already have the kingdom of God within us, and the king of that kingdom is supposed to be seated on the throne of your heart. And if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, that means you're letting him be the king of your life. His rule, his reign, his realm, his desire should be your desire. You should be submitted to him, Amen. obedient to him. That's the kingdom of God. Seeking first his rule in my life. Seeking first his will for my life. And he demonstrated it one time by saying, not my will, but thy will be done, Father. If it's possible for this cup to pass me by, and I talk to Jesus, do I have to do it that way? Yep, you need to forgive him. I don't want to forgive them. Amen. You need to forgive them. Amen. Forgive who? All oh, them 27 people you're mad at? I can remember when I first started walking with Christ. One night I got down, I was praying, and I had a list of 27 names of people that had been talking about me or said something that I was... And, and those words were controlling my life more than his word. That's right. See, when you, when you have unforgiveness... You're believing what they're saying about you more than what God says about you. I'm not who they say I am. I'm who he said, who, who I'm, I am who he says I am. Amen. And it's right, right there in the book. So my identity has to be wrapped up in his word and who he calls me out to. I'm a son of God. Amen. I'm an overcomer. I'm healed. How about that one? You know, he wants to heal you. He sent his word and healed you and delivered you out of all your troubles. He was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was placed upon him, and by the wounds that were placed upon his back, by his stripes, you are healed. He says, I am the Lord God that healed thee. Yes. So when we're asking him to heal us, we're not asking him to do something that's not his will. It is absolutely his will. He paid the price for your healing. Amen. So just go ahead right now and get healed. Amen. See, but you face it, is it that easy? Well, what did you have to do to get saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Well, believe on him as your healer. Believe on him as your deliverer. Believe on, upon him as your reconciler. Guess what? You know, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. Then verse 18, it says, now all things are of God. And then it says, uh, who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation, restoration of relationship, removing the enmity. He says, not holding the sins of the world against them. Amen. Not just his enemies or not just his children, but the sin of the whole world. Amen. When he died on the cross, he took care of the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who what? takes away the sin of the world. So when we are able to declare, I am forgiven, you can lift your head up and say, I'm healed. Yes. I'm delivered. Yes. Yes. Satan, you're trespassing in my life. Yes. Amen? You get out of my house. That don't mean you go throw your husband out or your wife out or your children out. You throw the devil out. Yes. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 
but against principalities and power. Now, now y'all know the devil uses people. Amen. And God uses people. Yes, he does. Amen? So you got to learn how to what? Love your enemies. Wow. How did he demonstrate that? He was on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them that are crucifying me, who are torturing me, because they don't really know what they were doing. In fact, in one place he said, if the devil would have known, known what he was doing, he wouldn't have crucified the Son of Glory. Amen. He didn't realize he was actually fulfilling God's plan. He was fulfilling God's prophecy. So we want the kingdom of God to be in our lives first, seeking first the kingdom of God. And so it doesn't come with outward observation. Because why? The kingdom of God is within you. Now whenever you start tapping into that by faith, dreams and visions, you'll be full of the Holy Spirit. The power of God's going to begin to operate. Conviction will come whenever you're walking in sin or unforgiveness, but he'll convince you of who you are also. Uh, any, any of y'all ever had like a supernatural charge of faith come upon you at any time in your life? I mean, you know what? God wants you to live with that faith. He's given you that faith. Yeah. Every one of us has the measure of faith. What are you going to do with it? Talk about it, teach about it, write five points about my measure of faith and how to use faith, or are we going to actually use our faith? Let me tell you, when, whenever you start speaking the Word of God with, with passion and with faith, something happens. You feel like you can what? Run through a troop and jump over a wall all of a sudden. When just a while ago, you didn't feel like you could do anything. What does the devil like to do with us? Put shame on us, guilt, condemnation, because we don't believe that he's really forgiven us. And whatever it is that's got a hold of us, when we know we're forgiven, we know that the one who forgave us can deliver us from that. That's what he did all the way through the scripture. He loved us so much he delivered us. I'll close. I've got so much right here. I, I, sometimes I set up too long before I get into the meat of it. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we'll start with verse 1. Y'all, who, who knows who wrote the book of Acts? Except Pastor Ronnie, you can't answer. No? Good guess, but that wasn't it. Luke. He wrote Luke, Luke and then he, he wrote Acts. So if you read the book of Luke, when you get to the last verse, go to Acts 1 and start, and you're going to continue on with Luke's writings. So he's writing this, and he's Dr. Luke, okay? The former account I made, O Theophilus, so he's recording this for this man, Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he through the Holy Spirit, say through the Holy Spirit, so even Jesus, when he taught, he knew it was the Spirit of God through him teaching. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Okay? So God anoints me, anoints you, so the Holy Spirit flows through me. That's why sometimes it amazes me on a Sunday morning, I'll be finished and like three or four different families of people come up, you must have been at my house this week. He was preaching just to me. No, I was, the Holy Spirit was talking to you. Okay? Then he says in verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after he suffered by many infallible proofs. In other words, he proved he was alive after he died. Being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. So after he was raised from the dead, the first thing he wanted them to understand was the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We've got to live in the kingdom of God. We're not just in this world. We're also in the kingdom of God. And it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it's a manifestation of the kingdom of God that's in you. It's power. And he's fixing to tell us that. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still looking for a natural kingdom. They're still looking outwardly. 
So they still didn't understand that the kingdom of God is not outward, it's inside of us. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons for which the Father has put under his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Say power. power. See, we need the Holy Spirit. Whenever you're walking in the kingdom of God, it's the manifestation of God's Holy Spirit in your life. The kingdom of God manifested in these guys' lives when they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now listen to what happens right here. This, I'm going to try to land the plane now. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus disappeared. This was going to be his last time that he was going to be talking to his disciples where they could actually see him physically. He's going to be taken up, it says. And it says, and while they looked steadfast towards what? Heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So where is Jesus? Where is he? he? I mean, right here, he's in heaven. And you know, the Bible talks about him being seated in heaven on the throne. And everything that is going to happen in the earth is going to come from heaven through us into the earth. So he fills them with his spirit. We can get into chapter 2 and see and all of a sudden, these same disciples who were running away, Peter, who denied him three times, now Peter gets up and preaches because he's full of the Holy Spirit. God in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And they begin to manifest the kingdom everywhere they went. In one place it says Peter, actually his shadow was healing the sick. There's so much power coming off of him that his, his shadow would cause people, demons to come out of people and they would be made whole. That's power. That's walking in the kingdom of God. So when you pray the Lord's Prayer and you say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, understand that the kingdom of God is in you. And when it manifests in you, then you can manifest it in the earth. And let me tell you, not everywhere you go can you manifest the power of God. Even Jesus, when he was in his own hometown, it says he could not do but a few miracles because he was around his relatives in his own town because what? They got too familiar with who he was. And you know what? I think we get familiar now. You hear the word preach. We watch it on TV. We got a radio that plays it. We got our iPhones that play it. We just listen to teachings and we get so familiar with it we forget that we can actually be doers of what we're hearing. And we start putting this on your pastor or, or on the preacher, the television preacher. You think, well, they got the power. No, you've got the power if you have the kingdom of God in you. And whenever you know that, you can start laying hands on the sick. You can also lay hands on yourself. You can pray for yourself. You can tell the devil to get out your own house. You don't need to have me go over and anoint your house. Usually the house he's messing with is this house right here. Not your physical house. Your spiritual house he wants to mess up. Amen? You will get anything out of this tonight? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Remember that over the holidays. Amen?